Gabby Thomas, welcome to the Running Effect Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's my off day, so. <laughs> awesome. First Happy. question for you. Uh, we're just picking up where we left off uh, before recording. We we're talking yeah. about ice stuff. Um, you're from Massachusetts or New yeah. Hampshire? Yeah, Massachusetts. Massachusetts yeah. So this is like a breeze for you. Yeah, you would think. You would think. So I was actually originally from Atlanta. I okay. was born in Atlanta, Georgia, did elementary school there, and then moved up to Massachusetts. And that's when I, yeah, started that journey. So I did high school up there, stayed up there for college. And I don't, you really just don't get used to it. And so as soon as I graduated, you know, from Harvard, I was like, I got to get back down south. Oh, even Harvard, like Boston's <laughs> horrible too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember like the distance runners. I know Graham Blanks pretty well. He just won oh, NCAAs. Yeah. Uh, set a collegiate record as well, Shout and like th I know, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they like do this thing called the tempo loop, which is a twelve hundred meter loop, um, which you would know like the street name. I don't know the street name because that's like the only path around Harvard that, that gets can, plowed. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you guys had like an indoor track. So yeah, we were pretty much training indoors like all year. Okay. From basically what like October through May, and so yeah, <laughs> just indoors all the time. We barely got on the outdoor track. And actually, in my entire time at Harvard, I never did a meet on the outdoor track. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so we were, we were texting about scheduling the podcast, and I think I sent a note to the extent of, like, it's going to be on Wednesday. People are talking about this storm. I'm from Ohio, so I don't yeah. really know. <laughs> I just right. moved to Austin. <laughs> That's right. So what's your, like, perspective on people who legitimately, like, freak out about this sort of thing? And I'm like, you know, you just got to roll with the punches. Like, it's really fine. I do understand that, you know, if the ices aren't safe or the roads aren't safe because it's icy. That's different. But they just got to get a Toyota. Gotta, yeah, yeah, get the 4Runner, man. Yeah. Get the TRD Pro. <laughs> just, like, bundle up and go. Like, you had, when you messaged me that, I had just come back from, like, trying to go to Merritt and get, like, an ice coffee. <laughs> and, like, they were closed until 9 because of the weather. And I was like, oh, my gosh, Texas. Like, you just can't do anything when Which it's cold. Which doesn't make sense either like <laughs> people like that seem like they flip because i ran the next morning and it was even colder than the day before and Merritt was like open at yeah, seven right <laughs> so it's like, like <laughs> people just can't take it man. right <laughs> let's talk about Merritt. uh pierce is here uh people won't see him or hear him uh he's taking photos but uh so pierce. pierce knows that like i'm the biggest fan of Merritt ever <laughs> i moved in that. june i think it was the first coffee spot i had and like I've tried so many places, yeah. And I was like, I just have to stop trying new places because yeah. Merit is the move. What's Merit the go-to coffee order? I am so simple, like cold brew, twelve ounce, washed Oof. every time. As soon as I walk in, it's getting ready. Like, <laughs> do they know I your order it. at this point? Uh, yeah, they know. Okay. It. They, okay, I'm in there every day. I live right by Merit, and so I'm actually moving next week, which makes me sad. But, oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So but every morning, Merit, same thing, iced coffee. I used to go in there and get the iced coffee and a pop tart. The trying. homemade pop tarts are I, amazing. They're amazing, right? But yeah. I'm trying to work on my diet and nutrition. <laughs> it's Olympic year. Gotta be. Gotta be, <laughs> gotta be dialed in. Gotta yeah. be dialed in. So, do they know like Gabby Thomas, Gabby Thomas, or are you known as just the girl who gets married every day? Um, at first, it was just the girl who got married every day. But as you get to know, like the baristas and the, the people who work there, they just they know what I do now. So they're like watching my races, keeping tabs on my career, like asking how training's going and everything. So they know all about like my whole career and journey, which is pretty nice. Is that kind of wholesome to have like fans and people you see every day who like don't understand track? It is. It is really wholesome because I mean, they see it from a different perspective and they're so excited about it and like their emotions about it are like so raw and it's just really like energizing. Um, especially in Austin, because people are just really excited about running and like health and fitness. And so they are just like, when they see you in person, they're like, oh my gosh. And so in Merritt, I mean, it happens all the time. They're like, oh my gosh, are you Gabby? I, oh, you look familiar. Like, oh my, like, are you, it's, it's really cute. That happened to me. I don't yeah. know if you remember. <laughs> so the story of how I came across you, I didn't even know you lived in Austin, which we'll get into like training yeah. in Austin. Cause I didn't really realize that there were as many high quality yeah. sprinters as there are who live and train here. But I was getting coffee with a friend. I had actually never met him before. A friend of a friend, like, introduced us to each other. We were getting coffee, um, put in the order, go to sit down, and then they call my name. So I go get the coffee and walk back, and this dog's in the way. So I, like, look down. I'm waiting for, like, the dog. I think he was, like, drinking water. And I look up because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to run into this dog. And it's Gabby Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, but I wasn't obvious. Like, I didn't know you lived in Austin. Yeah. I had no clue. So I see this like dog. Uh, it it's my a pug, dog? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I like, I look up and I'm like, 
oh my god like in my head i'm like oh my gosh it's gabby Tom. <laughs> like what it, it was one of those moments where i'm like that. why is she here because yeah. <laughs> i get not, that a lot they're like what are you doing in austin <laughs> so i'm like because i almost ran into him and so i'm like oops i'm like i'm so sorry and you're like oh no totally fine so i sit down and then i tell my friend who's like not in like he's in follow yeah. track i'm like dude that's like an Olympic medalist. Like, <laughs> what is going on? And he was like, you have to go up to her. So I think I got up and I just said, oh, didn't know you lived here. Like, big fan. Yeah. And, and sat down. Um, so it's I so funny. I get that all the time. So people you, are always pe like, what are you doing in Austin? Okay, like, oh, so yeah, people recognize here. you. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. That, do you, is that like nice or does it get stressful? Like, at a point, do you just want to get coffee and not be recognized? <laughs> it's stressful if I, like, am in a rush or if I'm, like, I look terrible and I really don't want to be recognized or take a picture. But it doesn't happen enough where I'm, like, worried about leaving my house or my apartment and like going to do something it happens like maybe like five times a week type of thing so it's it's totally fine um and it's nice yeah it's like if people recognize me I love when they say hi and just like give me some encouragement or like I love what you're doing or like I'm following your career like I love that yeah yeah because I remember I had a debate in my head of like oh, you know, she's a dream podcast guest, which is full circle, <laughs> yeah. as we're talking here. Like, she's a yeah. dream podcast guest. Like, should I ask her? And then I, the decision I ended up going towards was, like, like I I want you to be able to get coffee and not Aww. be bombarded. That's really, yeah. So it's, that's like, really I, I feel it's probably difficult. Like, that's a level of fame I never want to get to, honestly. Because, <laughs> like, I would just want to get coffee for the sake of getting coffee. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I feel like it'd be stressful. But so you, has that been a progression where, like, you've handled it better as time has gone on? or? Yeah. I mean, it's just it, track is not such a huge sport where it's really going to impact my day to day too much. So it's like. Totally fine. Um, at first, when I first started getting like notice, like after the Tokyo Olympics, I mean, it was constant. It was nonstop. That was a little bit stressful just because Olympic years, everyone's watching track and everyone's following, like especially American sprinters. So that was like, OK, can't leave my house without like someone saying something. And so that was a little bit much. But now it's like, I mean, it's calmed down and I'm so used to it. And yeah, it's, it's not crazy. And then for something like getting on a podcast, I mean, you never know with Instagram, like if you're actually going to get in touch with people. And so it's good we had like Pierce who could connect us. I know, like, shout you know, out Because like, you just miss so much of it. Or like we were talking about before, like when you have to go through agents or publicists, you can also get kind of lost in the shuffle. So if anyone like asks me in person to do something, I'm always like down to like get their contact and talk to them. Um, but yeah, it, it's cool. Let's go back to yeah. Merit. Uh, I'm not over this. <laughs> yeah, we love Merit. I know. I want them to sponsor the podcast. They actually followed me on Instagram, so that really? was that was big for me. That was big for me. That's huge. Um, still, I'm too shy to ask for a, a partnership, but it's coming. Yeah, it's um, coming. I'll send this to them. Hopefully they listen. <laughs> Shout out the owner or executive listening. Um, but I'm curious. So you said your order is 12-ounce cold brew. You yep. used some fancy terminology about something about wash washed, that I don't understand. Um, what goes into, like, because... Here's the thing. My mom says I don't actually like coffee because I like like lattes and stuff. And she's like, that's not real coffee, which I kind of understand. Uh, so cold brew, it's like straight up coffee. Oh, so yeah. how do you evaluate w what a coffee is better than a, a different coffee? My like, what boyfriend makes and I better? were just having this debate in Merit, actually. OK. And so it was a, it's a long journey for me. I mean, you're still young. You're 18. So when I was 18, I was still drinking like the Dunkin Donuts, iced coffee, cream and sugar. Didn't even Classic taste like Boston yeah, girl. Yeah, exactly. I was a Boston girl. Didn't taste like coffee at all. And you just kind of slowly like sophisticate your palate. And so I went from like Dunkin' to Starbucks. And then when I moved to Austin, I mean, it was all over. I went to like every local coffee shop and like I could just get like a taste for what I actually liked and what I appreciated. Um, and the coffee quality is just so good here. And there's so many coffee shops. I love it. And I, I just found what I liked. And I feel like Merit, the washed cold brew just tastes so good to me and I feel so good after drinking it like not too anxious not too jittery it's just like perfect and part of why I love Merit so much too is like it's not always just about the coffee it's also just about like the vibe and the energy it's right. like something like I look forward to waking up and walking to the coffee shop and talking to the people who work there and like talking to anyone who wants to talk to me like you for example um, people greeting my dog and it's part of the community. <laughs> it's just part of like my environment and it's part of like just my routine now and I, I love it. So that's really what it's about. But then also like sipping my coffee right. on the way to practice. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually going to be my follow up question. So like, you know, ranking a coffee one to 10, w what goes into the reading? OK, like if you're reading a coffee shop, how much does the coffee itself play into the ranking mm -hmm. versus like the ambiance, even like the music, the people, the baristas? Yeah. 
at least in my opinion, it's a sophisticated rating. <laughs> like it's is. more than just the coffee. Exactly. So much goes into it. So there's like the coffee taste, right? It's like, okay, a basic cold brew. Like how bitter is it? Like, can I actually get it down? Like, do I enjoy drinking this? That's part of it. Part of it's a vibe when I go in there. Like just what is the overall atmosphere like? And um, the people who work there, like when I'm having conversations and I'm talking to people, do I feel happy? Is this like uplifting my mood? Like, you know, like how do I feel after walking in and then after having walked out? Um, and that's pretty much what goes into it. Like those three things and merit hits them all. <laughs> that being that, I mean, Austin has a lot of really good coffee shops. It's one of my favorite parts of the city. Um, I love being in Austin and that definitely like went into it. I think merit's the one that hits everything in my opinion. Like yeah. I really like and Mozart's friendly. for like the, ja mm -hmm. like the music. Yeah. Um, but I don't think the coffee's as good and you have to wait 25 minutes to get yep. your coffee. Yeah. Merit is so <laughs> efficient. It hits all the boxes. Yep. It hits all the so, boxes. I gotta know, uh, Gabby <laughs> Thomas coffee shop coming soon. Would you ever start one? <laughs> I, yep. I talk okay. about this all the time. I think my retirement, like my post retirement career would be like having my own coffee shop. And this is like retirement, retirement. So yeah, when yeah. I retire from track and then I retire from like whatever job I want to do after track. And then when I'm retired from the workforce, I would love to just start my own coffee shop, even like a coffee food truck. Like that's my dream just because it brings community. It brings mm -hmm. really good conversations. Like it makes everyone happy and so nice. So yeah. peaceful. Can't so beat simple. It. How <laughs> much do you think the qualities you've learned from being like a high level professional athlete would go into something like starting a coffee shop? Like, do you feel like you've been equipped with a lot of Absolutely. valuable attributes that will make this coffee shop better yeah, than Mary? Absolutely. And I think that is my favorite thing about track is that everything can be applied outside of track. Like it really, the lessons you learn in our sport transcends like everything. Um, so I, I would feel very well equipped <laughs> to start a coffee shop and really start anything that I want to do. Um, your track has taught me like the hardest lessons and just like, the most simple lessons too. So yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Have you come up with a name yet, or is that still if in the I, development process? If I had process? to come up with a name, I mean, right now I think it would be like Good Life okay. Coffee Company. Good like Life. That's what it would be. Ooh, yeah. I love it. Is <laughs> yeah. uh, your dog's name is Rico? Right? Yeah, Rico. Okay. Yeah, he's a pug. D he's does, so cute. does he like? Is there gonna be a, a special spot for him? <laughs> like, what does that look like? I mean, absolutely. If it's like an actual coffee venue, I mean, I'm envisioning like a beautiful coffee shop and like a little dog park, like right next to the coffee shop, where people can go out there and enjoy their coffee with their dogs, or just let their dogs go out there and play <laughs> while they sit inside and do their work and like enjoy their coffee. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. And then maybe like a, a little treat station for them too, because they also deserve their like morning burst <laughs> of happiness. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, this is in the other cities you've lived in, but a, a surprising thing about Austin to me is how dog friendly it is. Mm -hmm. Like in Ohio, I don't think Rico is getting a spot in the coffee shop. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> is that so weird true. in Austin? Has that been really cool to like see how just like ran like even this? I've noticed this that the track I run at and train at a lot of the time. Dogs don't bark there because there's so, yeah. people and like the dogs are so used to like the active community. Yeah. Whereas Ohio, you're hearing your neighbor's dog. They're hearing you from like 200 meters away. Right. You know, they're barking at you. Like, I never get that in Austin. So yeah. what's that been like? I mean, I didn't grow up with pets. I didn't grow up with a dog. I mean, I was in Massachusetts and I mean, they have dogs there, but it's not like the super dog friendly type of state that you would imagine. Um, but I moved to Austin. I didn't have a pet, but I realized like how dog friendly it was and just how outdoorsy it was and just good vibes all around. So this is a place where like, I, I need to have a pet. I need to have a dog. And I lived alone and it was COVID actually. So I was living by myself. Training was weird. We weren't really competing. And so I was like, all right, I think it's time for me to get a dog. <laughs> and so um, I knew I loved pugs. So I went to the Austin Humane Society on their website because at the time you couldn't even go into shelters because of COVID. And I saw him on the webpage and immediately fell in love. So within like 24 hours, I had called them. I went and picked him up, fostered him for a week, and I was like, I'm keeping him. I just fell in love with him. So it's just been history since. But, yeah, I mean, having a dog in Austin, I think, is it enhances the experience. Everywhere you go, people are very dog-friendly. People are, like, welcoming of dogs. When I walk into Merritt, they recognize Rico first, and then they, and then they like, <laughs> recognize, oh, oh, Gabby must be here. And so I just I love it. And, um, I mean, having a dog just teaches you so much, too. It teaches you so much about responsibility and patience and just being loving and yeah it brings you outside a lot too which is what I love one of the things I love about Austin is being outdoors and exploring everything that that they have it's always good weather people are always friendly and so having a dog is just part of the culture 
Is there a place when you were talking about like getting out a lot? I feel like Town Lake, everyone goes on Town Lake. It's like super popular for runners specifically. Is there a particular spot in your mind that you're recognized the most at? Oh, recognized the most. That like you go to and you have to prep yourself mentally. When I'm on the trail, definitely. And I think that makes sense because like you're saying, there are a lot of runners, people who are in the health and fitness are probably hitting the trail. Um, And so whenever I do that, yeah, I can expect to be stopped and be like, oh my gosh, like, are you Gabby? Or like someone like, I can tell when people are checking their phone to see if it's me or not. (laughs) Um, And so that happens a lot. Um, Obviously, anytime I go to a track, if I go to a gym, those kind of environments. Um, Normally, if I'm just walking like, yeah, I don't know, around somewhere normal. It doesn't happen that frequently, which is why it's like okay for me to leave my place. But, you know, it, it makes sense, you know, certain, certain types of places that I go to. Uh, first off, shout out Gabby's mom if you're listening. I want to go back <laughs> to uh, young Gabby, seventh grade, uh, where I was reading an article. <laughs> and I, you know, you read articles and sometimes parents are interviewed or mentioned, but yeah. your mom was savage. She said something to the extent of, <laughs> I didn't want, you wanted to play softball and she oh, wouldn't yeah. let you. Yeah. Uh, and she said, essentially, I wouldn't let her because I didn't want to sit and watch softball <laughs> games for a full spring. <laughs> what were these conversations like for your seventh grade Gabby? I mean, I remember that so vividly. I wanted to play softball with my friends and I didn't want to do track. When I was, yeah, when you're like 12, 13, I didn't know anything about track and you probably did, but I didn't want to just run around in circles. It just didn't, it didn't sound fun to me. Um, but I knew that I was fast because I played soccer. And so I would just kick the ball and run past everyone in soccer. And my mom was like, all right, well, you're not doing softball. You need to do track. And she made me sign up um, for that first practice. And I just didn't want to be there. And I, <laughs> I just remember vividly, like, just hating it. Um, and I I did hate it for the first bit, for the first couple of years in middle school. But I mean, that's middle school. You just, (laughs) I just didn't like it. And I didn't like running and my friends weren't really doing it. So I had to make new friends and soccer was my first love. And so I wanted to be playing soccer and whatever. But yeah, I mean, she forced me to do that. Um, The same way she forced me to kind of do everything. (laughs) But I grew to love it. Um, And, and, you know, she knew what she was talking about. But I I think part of it is just like, you're going to thrive wherever you put effort and wherever you see yourself growing. And and that's kind of what I did with track. Um, I could have just went my entire career just not wanting to run or not like applying myself into it but at the end of the day you're gonna like find success wherever you wherever you put forth the effort you know and make make that effort too so it ended up being love my life so here I am but yeah she um she definitely forced me into it (laughs) I think a lot of people when they think of like track cross country running they don't think of it necessarily as like super competitive yeah we'll get into this as we kind of get into your most recent stage of your career the pro level which is obviously the most competitive like track and field is a brutally competitive sport (laughs) do you think soccer playing soccer beforehand and like how competitive soccer and contact sports are do you think that helped you as you transition into track to kind of give you that competitive spirit and edge versus some other kids who maybe their first sport was track and didn't really have that natural absolutely and I think every stage of my life has kind of been a stepping stone for the next Um, And I think that's really important for people to think about Um, at any stage of your life that you're into. You want to be thinking, what can you get out of this that will help me, like future me or help the next stage of my life? And you might not even be thinking about it consciously. But if you take yeah, track, for example, just being in sports growing up um, helped shape like that foundation for me to succeed in track because soccer was like my first love of sport. So it showed me how to really, really work hard. Like conditioning sucks. It helped me work as a part of a team. And it helped me, I think more importantly, learn how to deal with failure and just overcoming that. And failure was normal for me, like growing up as a kid. Like I was, you know, very used to just losing a game or having a bad practice. And like, it was just fine. Like I didn't cry about it. I didn't care. You just got to a point where that's part of sports and that's part of the beauty of sports. And so by the time I was in middle school and doing track and field, yeah, I mean, I was equipped with all of that. I, I knew how to be an athlete. I knew how to do sport. And so I just went into it with those same mindsets and those same strengths. Um, but that's kind of what it is. It's like using everything that you do as a stepping stone for the next. And so while soccer prepared me for track, I mean, track has prepared me for everything else that I do. It prepared me for Harvard. And then Harvard prepares me for grad school. And then, you know, those hard academics prepare me to be an Olympian. Everything just kind of bounces off each other. Right. If you have kids one day, have you thought about, like, 
the progression in sports you want them to get into? I know some people where they're like, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm going to make sure my kid's the next LeBron James and put him on a basketball court at four years old. I know other people <laughs> where they're that, like, yeah. I don't want to force them at all. Um, have you thought about that at all? I definitely think about it. And I, for me, I'm biased, but I think sports are just incredible. I think they are the best thing that you can do for a kid and like teaching them so many life lessons. Um, but you can learn those things in other avenues as well. You can learn them doing other extracurriculars. I mean, they can play an instrument. They can be an artist. Um, I will definitely encourage my kid to do a sport, and it could be any sport they want, whatever they're interested in, um, and just making effort because I think effort is the biggest piece of it, and that's really all that matters. And whatever level of sport they want to play, I, don't, I mean, I don't care. It doesn't matter. They don't, even, they don't even have to do high school sports if they don't want to, but there's just so much to be gained from playing sports. I mean, you learn the three things I talk about is like resilience and you learn discipline and you learn how to control your environment. Um, and those are just three things that I think carry you and um, set you up for success later in life. And, and sports just embodies all of that. As we've kind of chronicled and documented seventh grade mom forced you to do track <laughs> yeah. what was the shifting point from being forced to do track and going through the motions at practice probably thinking of getting back home as soon as you could <laughs> to actually yeah. enjoying the sport and looking forward to going to practice and getting better yeah so I think like seventh grade when I was forced to do it I mean I didn't really like it the whole season but yeah exactly I was going through the motions I was doing it it was fine by eighth grade you know my friends were on the team so I would just go and hang out with my friends basically and and go to practice, and, and, and that was that. And I was always fast, so I had that kind of validation going for me, so I wasn't, like, miserable every second, but, like, I just would rather be doing something else, right? And then I got to high school. You know, at this point, I had a pretty good group of friends. Like, these were my track friends. Um, it was a part of my routine. It was a part of my life. And then I started to slowly, like, set goals for myself, um, and that, I think, was the real like building blocks for me in terms of enjoying track and it also set me up for just all of my success later um, after high school and so I started set to set these goals and then that is what kind of built confidence for me so I was like okay I want to run this time I work towards it would get the time and then set another goal work towards it get that um, and I mean that's one of the great things about track is like it's just so straightforward like you know what you're working for and then once you get it you can you can keep striving for more and what you put into it is also what you get out of it. And so you know when you're cheating yourself, you know when you're you know, not doing your best and not working your hardest because it's gonna show literally in your results. And so I, I kind of like that and it's kind of like becomes an obsession almost to like work really hard and like obtain what you're working for and then to do more and more after that. And so I think that's when I started to really love track. It's like I was seeing that and I was getting that validation, I was getting that confidence and it was really fun for me. Um, and then I, uh, got the opportunity to run in college. And so I never imagined that I'd be, you know, running for a D1 program or even running in college at all. Like it was, just, was never on my vision board. And so when that happened, I mean, it was a whole new journey of track. <laughs> a lot of professional athletes talk about kind of the moment of watching an athlete, looking up to them and that kind of fueling and inspiring that next year or two yeah. of growth. For you, I think it was at your grandma's house. The Olympics yeah. was on, and you saw Allison Felix. Take me through that moment, how it fueled you, yeah. and then years down the road, ultimately racing her and sharing post-race hugs with her yeah. and all of those moments coming full circle. So I think it's a little different than what people would imagine. So when I saw Allison on TV, yeah, my mom had told me to turn on the TV. I was in Alabama at my great-grandma's house, and Olympic trials were on. And she was like, uh, turn this on. This girl looks like you. So I turn it on. I see Allison Felix. Um, I didn't know who she was at the time. I didn't even like know what Olympic trials was. <laughs> but she, I saw she had really long legs and she just looked like a gazelle and like was crushing it and just was this really empowering female athlete. And so when I at that age, you know, I, I'm not thinking I want to be a professional athlete. I didn't even know what professional track was. But it's something that I think goes into your subconscious. It's like, OK, now I see someone who is a female athlete who's very powerful um, who's succeeding and you kind of internalize that and so I'm not thinking oh now I'm going to be a professional athlete but like it instills confidence in me because I'm like okay I, I've seen that and it's something that now I know that I can do um, even if that's not the path I want to go on and I think that's like the important key piece of it is like you don't have to totally desire to be that person or do what that person's doing but 
I just understood that. And so that was really helpful. And I mean, after I knew Allison Felix existed, but I, I never thought about professional track again after that. Like I was, I went about one my, and done. Yeah. Well, right. I was like a high school girl. I was like, just trying to do my, my academics, get my good grades and do my sport, whatever. Um, and then when I ended up racing against her, I mean, that was a surreal moment because it brought me back to that that moment like years ago when I was watching her on TV and I'm like, oh my God, like now I'm in this position. Like someone might be turning on their TV and watching me running and talking about, oh, look at her, she reminds me of you. And that was a very surreal moment for me. Um, but getting to that point, it was never about, oh my gosh, I wanna be Allison Felix or I wanna do this or be that. That comes from just this innate desire to just work really hard and just do things. So whenever I'm presented with something that's difficult or if I have a goal or a dream, like just going after it and then getting there. Um, it's always like very in the present day for me. It's like step by step. Um, and I found myself in that on the track, like racing against Allison. And that that's when it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, I've like, I've done it. Like this is something that's, this dream is a reality. Um, but yeah, so that, that was incredible. But getting to that point was really just like pure discipline and, and just working towards it. Yeah. Do you think people who watch athletes like yourself run and really look up to you and, you know, watch every mm -hmm. Olympic trials, watch every U S champs and are like, you know, I'm going to be Gabby Thomas one day. Like mm -hmm. I want to be like her. Um, what are your thoughts on like, I don't think that's bad, but I think most people don't understand the years of hard work yeah. and dedication and doubts yeah. and all the different <laughs> things that have gone into the Gabby Thomas they're watching for yeah. 21 seconds. What are your thoughts on kind of the balance between, you know, an athlete looking up to you, but also realizing like what it's like to actually be you? Yeah, I think journey? that's a really important point and question to bring up because, yeah, there's a lot. There's <laughs> There's a lot of space between being at a stage in life and then looking up to someone and wanting to do what they're doing. Um, and I think it's important that people do see what I'm doing and feel like they can do it because if anyone can be an Olympian or an Olympic medalist, <laughs> like if I can do it, then literally anyone can do it. Um, cause I am a very like lazy person, <laughs> but <laughs> like off the track. Um, but there, the, yeah, there's so much that goes into it. Um, and there's just so many years and I, I just think about how far I've come and I think about when I was in college and I had never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be a professional runner, that I'd be a professional athlete. I just, it wouldn't have occurred to me. I didn't know it existed. I didn't know what track and field was outside of the Olympics. Um, and I think about when I went to NCAAs my sophomore year. So I went to NCAAs indoor and I was preparing to run and I was thinking, all right, well, this, hopefully this goes well. Um, and I felt like I had prepared for it. And then I went and raced and I just, I got dead last and it was really, really embarrassing. And I was like, I, I don't know how this happened. Um, I just literally lost and it, it was so embarrassing. And I, I, I couldn't have imagined that happening to me, but it did. And that was a moment for me to take a step back and be like, okay, I just lost, <laughs> and but I had to sit with that loss for an entire year. Like for a year, I was a loser, and I had to go back to the drawing board and fix whatever went wrong and, and sit with myself and figure it out. But that was like a long time for you to have to sit with that disappointment, a long time before another opportunity came for me to prove myself and that I could win. And then the next year comes around, and I actually did win. But that whole year was really hard. Like I was in a really dark place, and I had to go to practice every single day not knowing if I was going to have another opportunity to win that race again, not knowing if I was going to ever run fast again. That's, it's just every single day you have to have a whole new like emotional and mental physical battle with yourself. And then eventually I did go and I, and I won, I broke the collegiate record and that's when my track career took off and everything changed. But it just isn't as easy as, okay, you're going to go run fast <laughs> and get medals and go pro and, and do this and that. There's so much that goes into it every day. Um, and that, and that's a big piece of it. How important do you think it is to have the losses fuel you and more importantly, like make you hungry and make you work for it? Because I could be wrong here, but like if you placed fourth or fifth in that race, you just walked me through, like you may have not approached that next year as 
you know, yeah. intently and meticulously as you did, which kind of led right. into what we see today. So how right. important do you think it is to let the losses fuel you, but also be set in reality of like, I'm at this point and I have this much further to go. Like, I'm not going to be delusional. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said before, I think that losses are very important. Um, they can fuel you. I don't think losses have to be this rock bottom point of motivation. And I don't think it has to be that for anyone. Um, for a lot of people it is. Like if you lose or you fail at something, now you're like fired and fueled up. I think that works for some people. But I think for the most part, it needs to be just a source of comfort. Like you just need to generally be comfortable with failure. And now in society, we just see failure as this big negative thing. It's like a bad word if you fail. Oh my gosh, it's like the end of the world. But it needs to be so in like embedded in your life and <laughs> just to fail at things and to lose and and to just accept that for what it is and accept that for where you are um, and move forward. So I, I think that's kind of where we need to go with that. Um, for me, yeah, I lost that race. And I think because it was so high profile and so embarrassing, it really like motivated me. But I had so many losses prior to that. But I don't even think of them because it was just part of my journey. And even now I, I lose a lot of races I just don't dwell on them. I don't focus on them too much. And people don't read about it because it's really just okay. It's a part of the journey and it's fine. Um, so, I mean, if I would say anything about losing and, and failure, that would be it. Just accept it as part of your journey. Do you ever think about like your younger self or younger athletes, how they see someone like you? And I'm sure a lot of people feel this listening right now. They're like, oh, she failed on her way to greatness. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people, I lose a lot, yeah. uh, when they, <laughs> look what the athletes they look up to they think they made it on the sunshine and rainbow road where like yeah. there were no setbacks there were no failures you were hitting your splits every single practice know, when reality yeah. was like is far from it um how important yeah. do you think it is for professional athletes like yourself to be open and vulnerable about like yeah I've had low moments in my career I've failed a bunch yeah. in my career and like that's what's made me great I think it's really important for us, especially as pro athletes, to talk about those low moments and those setbacks. Um, thankfully, with social media now, I think people have more access to those types of moments. But I still think we could do an even better job of like just having that type of transparency with people who are looking up to us. And so I try to do that with my social media, with my TikToks. I try to like show every part of the journey because, yeah, it's really motivating and inspiring to see when people are on their highs and they're doing really well. Like, that is really inspiring. But it is so important to know what goes into it and to see the setbacks as part of it too. Like when I'm in the weight room, like so many, just so many failures I have in the weight room, which is a big part of sprint training. And I'm trying to show that on my social media pages too. Like for every PB I get, I mean, there are so many days where I'm just frustrated <laughs> and I haven't gotten it. Same with the track. I mean, with every, you know, PB I run, it's like, no, there were so many bad races before that. And I, I probably lose more races than I win, but people wouldn't really know that. Um, and, and that's okay. And so, yeah, I would say it's really important for us to kind of showcase those moments as well. Um, Cause it's a big part of our journeys. <laughs> it's just a huge part of it. For sure. Yeah. Uh, going back to that high school period that we were just briefly mm -hmm. talking about, you won 11 New England track and field titles across the 100, 200 <laughs> relays, long and triple jumps. Didn't realize you had that kind of range. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty much, I was recruited a lot as a jumper as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What were those titles like and which do you remember the most? Gosh. So uh, to be honest with you, I, I couldn't even have told you how many titles I had when I was in high school or now because it was never about that for me, mm. which is also something that I really want to highlight. Um, it was about the fun of it and the journey of it and bettering myself. And so when I think about the titles and the numbers, I, I could never have told you how many I got. But when I, uh, gosh, I mean, I think the most memorable for me would be senior year when our school, like Williston, we had won the New England champs. Um, it was either senior or junior year, but the women's team had won. And for me, that was such a special moment because I had grown to love track. I had grown to love my coaches. I loved my teammates. And it was something that we all really, really cared about. Um, and we all came together and did our best. And we had created this environment and created this culture that was conducive to just winning and being our best selves as athletes. And so being a part of something like that was so special, especially in a sport, track and field, where everything can feel really individual. Um, we came together as a team and we, and we made that happen. And that was kind of my one of my first experiences with being a part of an environment that I felt like made me better. Um, and again, like 
one of the three pillars that I talk about that I contribute to you know, my success, um, environment being one of them. It's just it's hard to put into words how influential and how important that is. And so I was really blessed in high school to at least be a part of a team, a part of a culture that helped grow me. And so without that, I'm not sure how successful I would be right now, but you're surrounded by people who want to be better themselves, who want you to be better, who are pushing you and challenging you, and they are not bringing you back. They're not bringing you down. And what I always tell people, especially people younger than me, so a lot of your listeners, um, you can make a choice and you can be around people who are pushing you forward or they're, or they're bringing you back. And those are really the only two types of people that you're going to be around. And so you want to be very conscious and mindful of who you're, who you're around and who you're spending your time with. And that team was that. That high school team was that. The coaches, the medical staff, my teachers, my friends, my teammates, and that, you know, that win really exemplified and showcased that. You mentioned early on in your response there the aspect of like having fun and kind Mm -hmm. of doing it for the love of the thing itself. I'd love to dive deep into that because I think so many people do this sport or any sport Mm. for that matter for a metric or result. Uh, They want the state title and that's the only reason they do it for the accolade of winning a state title rather than track is something I enjoy. I enjoy pushing my body. I enjoy being with my teammates and if a state title is a byproduct of that, great. If yeah. not, it's not the end of the world. How important do you think it is to have like a solid fuel source like that that's sustainable yeah. rather than the other side, which maybe you'll get a state title, but you won't last long in the sport because yeah. that doesn't it's not sustainable. Yep. I will say everyone that I am around who is in the sport for longevity or doing really well or just have titles and medals are doing it because they have understood that they are mastering the journey and enjoying the process. No one that I'm around is fixated on medals. They're not fixated on these titles. They're not fixated on just getting first place and, and doing this and like this, you know, these small kind of little accolades that you that are out of your control at the end of the day. No one's, no one's focused on that. Um, the people who are, I mean, I just don't really know them because they're either out of the sport or just they've just (laughs) they haven't (laughs) figured it out yet right um and so i think it's really important to bring up that point you want to one be having fun um and be passionate about whatever you're doing but also just focusing on things that you can control winning a state title is just out of your control you don't know what your competitors are going to do you have no control of what's going to happen in the other lane or or what what kind of shape they're in but you can control what you're going to do and you can control like being the best athlete that you can be and then being the best version of yourself. And that's all you can. That's all you can do. And so for me, that the best advice I could give you is just to focus on your own journey and have fun and enjoy it. Um, and, and that'll set you up not only for like success and winning, but it'll like set you up for longevity. Um, and as you get older, you realize how impressive and how important that is. Like when I think about people who I look up to in the sports world, it's not people who had one blazing fast time and then we never see them again. It's people who are in it for the long haul and who have, you know, prolonged success and have really like mastered the journey and mastered the sport. That's what's really impressive. And it's it's sustainable because you're happier. <laughs> like you're just overall enjoying it and you're happier too. So, yeah. Along similar lines, how important do you think it is to be – to chase after something for the right reasons. And here's what I mean by that. Like, I think a lot of people would look at you and they see the titles, they see the medals, Mm -hmm. they see the New Balance sponsorship, the Toyota car, and they're like, I want that. Yeah. But they don't actually (laughs) want the things that got you those things, if that makes sense. Like, they're not actually chasing after it for the right reasons, right? Like, they want the New Balance sponsorship, but, like, that's not why you are successful. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, And I think that's such a problem with younger (laughs) athletes specifically in the world of social media. It's like, even social media, they want the followers. Like, they want the recognition and accolades, but, like, you won't get the recognition and accolades if that's how you go about it. I think that's a great point, especially in the age of social media right now. It is so easy to compare your journey and compare what you have right now to what everyone else has, but... When I was coming up, and I can speak from my experience, is I I never thought about any of that stuff. I didn't know that you could have these track and field sponsors, like, going into it. I just, I didn't know that you could have a shoe deal. I didn't understand that until it was happening, and New Balance was making a deal with my agent. I didn't know that Olympic sponsors would come and sponsor you. I didn't realize you could make money doing this kind of stuff. Um, And I I wasn't thinking about social media because I didn't grow up in the— the era of social media influencers. Right. <laughs> it wasn't a thing. So when I never dreamed of having a high follower count, I was just putting one step forward every day and living my my dreams and focusing on my own journey. 
And it has been a very, very long and hard journey. And <laughs> people don't like see any of that. They don't see the times at Harvard when I would call my mom every other day and say, I don't want to do track anymore. Like I'm quitting the team. This is not for me. Um, they don't see the conversations I have with my college coach where he had to sit me down and say, this isn't intramurals. Like you got to figure it out. We, you're not going to make it if you keep doing what you're doing. Um, and so those, I mean, and those were months of my life that people don't see. And so, yeah, it's just about being the best version of yourself that you can be. Um, and everything just comes, everything falls into place as it should and being authentically you. Um, and yeah, everything, everything really does have to be for the right reasons. You'll, you'll burn out if you're focusing on just achieving accolades and, and, and sponsors and money and followers and all these like things that don't really matter. You'll just kind of burn yourself out. Um, it's just about being unapologetically you and, and doing what you're passionate about. I love that. Snaps to that, as you <laughs> can say these days. Um, there's a specific aspect I want to go through with you, and that's the aspect we're talking about, like your success, going about things the right way. Yeah. I think an aspect of success that most people don't realize about someone like yourself is the immense trade-offs you've mm -hmm. had to put in over the years. Mm -hmm. And there was a quote I came across maybe like last year that I've like, it's been imprinted in my brain, not actually because I had to pull it up on my phone, <laughs> so I haven't memorized. Um, and now it's off my phone, so now i got to <laughs> no go back to it. Um, but the, the quote is that I think puts this kind of concept super, super well. Um, the quote is, life is a series of trade-offs, and greater results usually require greater trade-offs. The question is not, do you want to be great at this? The question is, what are you willing to give up in order to be great at this? So I'm curious, what are some of the biggest trade-offs you feel like you've had to embrace over the years to experience the success you have? Yeah, and I I actually really like that you use the word trade-off too because a lot of people say sacrifice, and I think my college coach um, explained it to us freshman year that he doesn't like to think of them as sacrifices. He thinks of them as choices. And so you can really do anything you want. and you know, Everything is within your control and everything is a choice, but you are making a choice to do something and and that's it. So if you want to go out with your friends on Friday night when you know you have Saturday practice, that's completely fine. And you just you know what you're setting yourself up for. And that's kind of how I looked at it. Um, it made it a little bit easier. It made it feel like things were more in my control. And I wasn't, you know, sacrificing fun. I wasn't sacrificing junk food. I wasn't sacrificing any of that. I was just making a choice. I was doing what I preferred to do. And so, I mean, that has looked like trading off time with friends. Um, I can't do everything that everyone does. I can't stay out late. I can't go grab drinks. I can't go out to eat every time I'm offered because eating out normally isn't good for you. I can't spend too much of my energy, you know, being outside with people doing something when it, I need to be recovering because that's a huge part of my job. Um, and so that, I mean, that's a big part of it. And, and being around people who understand that, I mean, that can also be really hard. And that ties into the environment piece. Not everyone's going to really understand what journey you're on. And it's not meant for them to understand and That's okay. You know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's really the biggest thing that I've had to trade off and sacrifice. Um, it, it all just comes down to what choices I'm making. And I think about maybe trading off you know, a post-grad career um, outside of track and field. You know, when I went to Harvard, I wasn't thinking about running pro track. You know, I was majoring in neurobiology and I wanted to go into healthcare and that was kind of my dream at the time. And so I've made a choice now to focus on track so that I could make the Olympic team and get an Olympic medal and set myself up for like in the best way to do that. Um, so I've kind of had to put that on hold. Um, but again, I think of it as a choice and not so much of a sacrifice. And and I think I'm okay with that. It's hard to like define something as a right or wrong choice. Cause again, right. that at the end of the day, it's like the person gets to choose what they think is best for them or right. what they want to do at the end of the day. But I hear high schoolers specifically, like, I think I love this conversation cause I think that's what makes or breaks someone is like the choices that they make. Exactly. And it's a question of like, yeah, how bad do you want it? Like, exactly. are you willing to make the uncomfortable choices day in and day out, not just for a week, not just for a month even, but year on end and that consistency aspect exactly. compounds. For you, in your opinion, what are the biggest things you think that hold someone back from, and again, I'm going to use the word right here, but from making the right choices that will lead to success in track and field? 
Oof. I mean, and track and field and everything. I mean, I would say number one, like I keep saying, is your environment, the people that you're around. That will make or break how far you go in track and field. It will. It's the number one thing. Um, if you're with people who are constantly persuading you to just do things that aren't conducive to track, it, it's going to bring you down. And it might not be the right or wrong thing. It just might not be the right thing for track. Like if you're constantly eating junk food, if you're constantly talking negatively about sports, complaining about practice, that's going to do it. Going out late, I mean, all of that. You need people who are just pushing to be better and they'll bring you up. Um, that's part of why I just moved to Austin to train with a different group of girls just because they were Olympians and they knew what it took and I needed to be around that if I ever wanted to be an Olympian. So that's number one. I would say the second thing is your mindset about training. It's like your resilience. Um, you know, if you're going to have bad days, how do you come back from that? Um, if, you, if you're afraid of failing, if you're afraid of going to a meet and losing, like that, that's going to hold you back a lot. It's your mindset of how, how you go into it. Um, and then I'd say the last thing would be like, I know, you know, David Goggins, but it's your sheer like discipline and willpower. <laughs> like it's accepting that it might suck for a long time. <laughs> and like I told you, I'm a very lazy person. So for me, like if I can go out there and do track workouts every day, then I know anyone can because mm. no one wants to just like run around in circles for an hour. And that's what I love about track because it's so literal and figuratively, but like no one wants to just go run and do something so boring. <laughs> but like <laughs> sometimes you just have to put your head down and do it. Like you have to do it and you have to accept it and you have to get through it because that's going to get your results. And so having that willpower and that discipline to do it, I mean, that's got to be like the third thing to, to get you to have success in track and field. There are going to be a lot of days like that where you just don't want to do it and you got to, it's just part of the life. How important do you think it is to embrace the boring aspects of success, like <laughs> the the small aspects you just kind of mentioned there of the things that are like boring and monotonous, but yeah. are actually the things that if you do them day in, day out, will lead to success, whether it's like the bland diet you have to yeah. have or even like something like stretching for five minutes before mm -hmm. bed doesn't seem like anything in the moment for one day. But if you right. do it 365 days, like those are the small, boring things that lead exactly. to success. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that is success. Success is all of that. I mean, it, it's the boring moments that all come together and, and create these great moments. And so when you see someone on the podium and they have a gold medal and they're excited and they're so happy because it's such a glamorous moment, that's really just a culmination of so many boring moments that you don't see. And they're the boring moments you don't want to see. Like when, especially we, we talked about social media, when you're looking at someone's social media, they're not posting those really, really boring <laughs> workouts because right. you don't want to look at that. Like you're not going to sit and watch someone do like 300 repeats 10 times over and over again at the same boring pace. Like you're just not going to watch it because it's not fun to watch and it's not fun to do either. It's really hard. It's strenuous and it's really boring to do. Um, but that's what wins medals. And so that's, that's really it. And so when we're not showcasing that, people forget that that's actually what it takes uh, every week. I mean, the most, I say the most successful athlete is probably the one that has the most boring life. Mm. The athlete who's running around like doing fun promos and doing flashy workouts and all that. I mean, that's not the recipe to success. Look at like Noah Lyles. I mean, he's, he's someone who just keeps his head down and works really hard. You see his flashy moments, but he has way more boring moments <laughs> than you can imagine because that's part of it. So, yeah. I want to talk about your years at Harvard. Uh, specifically, let's start on the education piece. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this, I think, briefly in our conversation, but you majored in neurobiology and global health policy. Yeah. Uh, something, admittingly, <laughs> that I've come across in the podcast and talking to some of the best NCAA runners is how many take the easy path and <laughs> yeah. admittingly will we'll st straight up say, like, I'm an athlete student, which yeah. I always laugh about. <laughs> I love it. Um, and they'll be like, I am intentionally taking communications because I need to be focused Period. for my track workouts. <laughs> right. So for you, what was the decision to do the opposite thing? And yeah. do you think that came with the aspect of at that point, as you mentioned, you weren't thinking about track as a full time career? Yeah. So first part of it is, I think, I attribute a lot of my success, like I said, to just wanting to push myself and enjoying the journey. Um, so I've always loved a challenge. And so for me, I knew I wanted to go to an academically rigorous university and I wanted to study neurobiology. And I knew that was going to be really hard. Um, but 
it was in my plan and I wanted to do it. And so when the opportunity to go to Harvard came up, I mean, I was like absolutely 100% excited about it. It was actually, it came down to being between Harvard and Duke. And I ended up just choosing Harvard because it was a better fit for me track wise. And your parents went but to Duke, right? Both of my parents so was went that to hard Duke. for them? No, they were pretty happy okay. about it. Yeah, they were like happy with my decision. But <laughs> it was a hard one for me though because I, I loved Duke and the culture, but I think Harvard just ultimately was a better fit culturally. And, and at the time, like I mentioned earlier, I had a great appreciation for the environments that I was in. And Harvard had an incredible environment um, that even to this day, I feel like is a testament to my success. Just having that, that foundation of that team and that coach. I mean, I'm so grateful for that. It was, it was a great culture. Um, and for anyone who's thinking about running in college, 100%, just think about the environment that you're in because that's going to determine your success, not, you know, the accolades of the team or what, what the girls have done on the team. It's going to be the best fit for you and where you can find success. But going into that, yeah. So I wasn't thinking about track was not kind of on the back burner. Track was like, okay, that'll be something that I'll do. Um, in my, you know, my free time kind of like an IM, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be at the time, <laughs> but I learned, but yeah, I mean, I wanted to do neurobiology and I, I wanted to do something that would challenge me. And I think that's just always been a part of my nature and my personality to do something that was going to be really hard and that I'd have to push through and just be disciplined and get through. Um, and that kind of just transcends every aspect of my life, including track. Um, and so that's another important thing to, to think about when you're, when you're doing track or anything and trying to succeed at anything, it's like, okay, you're going to have to be uncomfortable and push yourself and be in settings that are, that are just really hard. Like I remember being freshman year at Harvard, like going to my professor's office hours and like begging him not to fail me. I was like, I think I'm just going to fail this course, but <laughs> I need anything, anything I can do right now <laughs> to not fail. Like tell me I'll do anything at this point. Um, and that's kind of like, the state of duress that I was in during that time. And I was trying to balance that and track at the same time. And it was, it was just really difficult. Um, but I was determined to get through it. I was, I was determined and by any means necessary, I was going to, and then, um, yeah, track just took off after that. Um, I can't remember the like second part of your question, but <laughs> I think you answered it. I think yeah. you answered it. There's an aspect of your story specifically in college that I didn't know about uh, mm -hmm. until I was doing some prep for this episode that I thought was fascinating. I read about, you know, you talked about the biology thing. I think yeah. even more interestingly enough, you kind of completely took a, a step back. Um, and I believe you took an eight week study abroad oh, yeah. program <laughs> in West Africa. Yeah. That's not what I think of when I think of <laughs> trying to be an Olympic medalist one day. So what was that decision like? And more importantly, as you reflect back on it, years removed from it, do you think that kind of saved your career as a whole? I do. Yeah. I think taking that break from track and field did save my career. Um, so after my sophomore year when, yeah, I had just a pretty rough season, like a bad season of track. I, I had too much going on, like just in college. The, the classes were just kicking my butt. They were so hard. I was trying to do other extracurricular activities just to like prepare for my future. I was doing like a business club. I was doing social clubs. I was, I had a job because I had to work, um, to help with tuition. So it was just a lot going on because I mean, Harvard doesn't give scholarships. So I had to work. And then I was like, you know what, this, this is a lot. And so my track career definitely suffered during that time. And that's when I got dead last at NCAAs. And I was like, you know what, we're going to have to take a break. And so I went to my coach after that season and I was like, I, I'm going to go abroad. And I had applied to this program kind of on a whim and gotten in and it was eight weeks in Senegal, um, which, you know, I, I could train, but probably not. <laughs> and so I had to forgo like the rest of the season. I wasn't going to nationals or anything like that. And he was obviously disappointed, but I think, you know, one of the great things about having him as a coach is he saw me as a holistic person and wasn't super hyper-focused on these medals and these exact little moments and accolades. And so it was kind of a bigger picture moment for both of us. Um, so I did, I just, I, I ended my season a little bit early and I went to Senegal for eight weeks and it was just completely different. I wasn't worried about anything that I was worried about in America. I wasn't worried about, you know, track and field in my times. I wasn't worried about my exact grades and neurobiology. I wasn't worried about who I was hanging out with or any of that. It was just a really, really great experience because I was learning about the culture. I was learning about myself. I was in the present moment constantly. And all of these problems that were back in college just felt so small. 
Um, so by the time I came back, I was one, really excited to be back because living was a little bit, it, it was definitely more challenging over there. So I was really grateful. I was excited to be back. I felt refreshed. And then I ended up having the best season of my you know, college career that junior year. So it was, it was definitely necessary. What were those last two years like? And can you take me through the NCAA championships and specifically the mm -hmm. collegiate record? I, I watched the race this morning and uh, your facial expression <laughs> when you figured it out uh, that oh you gosh. won and, and set a record was super special to watch. Yeah, um, I remember. Yeah, that, I remember that very well. Um, I remember the last practice going into NCAAs. My coach had sat me down and said, this is going to be redemption. And because, you know, the last year it was just really bad. And he said, this is your time to redeem yourself. And for me, it was about resilience. It was about I'm not going to let that failure bring me down. I'm not even going to let that the thought of that failure like creep into my mind and even become like a subconscious thought. Um, and so I had just really intense workouts leading up to that meet. Um, it was all mind over matter. I kept telling myself that. And then I got to the meet and I just wanted to be in a position to not just to do my best. Like I, I, I knew what a bad race would be for me and what a good race for, would be for me. And did I expect to win? No. <laughs> I mean, I remember like Lena Irby on the outside lane <laughs> and everyone talking about her. Um, she's now my training partner and I love her. <laughs> <laughs> full circle. I, yeah. Right. A full circle moment again. Um, I remember how nervous I was, but I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can do. Like I knew when I got to the line that I had prepared, I had done what I could do, what was in my control. Um, and I was okay with that. And so people always ask me, do you get nervous before races and how do you feel before races? And yeah, I think a little bit of nerves is normal, but I'm not overly nervous before races ever. It doesn't matter if it's Olympic trials or Olympic final or Texas relays. Like I'm not because I know what I've done leading up to that moment. I know if I'm ready or not. And so I know what to expect um, and I know what I can control. And so that's kind of the first time I had shifted into that mindset was at this NCAA meet. And so when I ran and I ended up winning, I mean, that was definitely a shock for me. And then a collegiate record was an even bigger shock. But I think what I was most proud of is the resilience piece of it. It's how that that same exact track, that same exact meet the year before, I'd got dead last, and it was really bad. And then this year, I had won and had a collegiate record and done it with Harvard on my chest, which is just not really heard of. And so that, that was what I was most proud of. Did your mom, next conversation, go to you? Told you so. Told you so in seventh grade. <laughs> she loves to say that. She loves to say I told you so with the track thing. And she did. I mean, she knew what was best. And That's the history. Know, did yeah. yeah, you just got to push it. You got to push yourself and challenge yourself. And I think, you know, learning that from the age of 12 was really important. Let's talk about yeah. New Balance. Yes. When did they approach you? Yes, yes, yes. Well, let me ask you this, <laughs> this first. Uh, in your entire life, when was the first time you like heard of New Balance? What was the first product you ever Ooh, owned? Oh, that New is Balance? a great question. I think, I mean, growing up, we just knew New Balance as a dad shoes. Um, <laughs> that was it. I think everyone can relate to that. It, it just, it was. That was a dad shoe. And then in high school, I was just wearing whatever the cheapest running shoes were at the time. We, yeah, we weren't too worried about like the high performance shoes. At least I wasn't in high school. Um, I wish I was, but. I was very hey, you got anything. 11 titles. Nothing yeah, to worry yeah, about. right. <laughs> and then when I got to college, Harvard was sponsored by New Balance. And so that was the first time I really got comfortable with their footwear and understood like the quality of it. Um, and yeah, I liked it. I didn't have much experience with anything else. So it was kind of my default. It's all I knew. And then um, it just was a really good fit. So when I went pro as a junior, I didn't know what going pro was. I didn't understand that, you know, athletes would sign shoe deals and whatnot. And at this point I was 21. So the fact that I didn't know was crazy. So my agent and my coach had to sit me down and explain how everything was and how it went. And we had a few offers, but I think New Balance was such a perfect fit because I was just a Massachusetts girl. They're like family owned. Um, I just, I love their values. I had been wearing it the last three years. I had won my national title in the New Balance shoes. And so it, w it was incredible. And, and they don't oversaturate, you know, their athletes. They don't have like a bunch of athletes who, you know, they don't care what they're putting out there. Like, no, we are a family. Um, we know what the brand stands for. And it was just such a natural fit. So I'm really glad it happened. On the, the similar line of like sponsors, I'm so curious, Toyota, where does that yeah. one come from? <laughs> and what's it like to be in my mind, I follow the sport 
closely, maybe not close enough to exactly know this. I don't know of any other athlete off the top of my head in the running world that's sponsored by a car company. <laughs> uh, so what's that like? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that one's also special. Um, all, any sponsor that I have, it's very aligned with my brand and aligned with me and my values. So that's always first and foremost. And I'm always going to be an athlete who's like that. Um, and, and I respect other athletes who were like that as well. And Toyota just was also a, a very natural fit. I mean, what they're looking for is athletes who really promote their values and their brand as well, which is, you know, start your impossible. Let's go places. And it's about going after what you want, you know, having those big dreams and going after it and not letting anyone stop you or get in the way. And I feel like my career just embodies that. I feel like my mindset embodies that. And every athlete that they have also signed embodies that. And it's, it's really special. And I think a really cool thing about sponsors is if you can just have, yeah, the sponsorship, but also just the brand partnership piece of it. Like just having a partnership that goes both ways. Like you both have values that are in, aligned and in sync. Um, you both are supporting one another. Um, I think that's really important. And that's kind of what my my brand partnerships and my sponsors embody. Okay, Gabby, I got to pick your brain here. Uh, in, in relation to the sponsorship yeah. thing, we're going to talk about New Balance and Toyota. Yeah. New Balance. Let's say I'm looking for, there. I feel like, you know, amazing performance shoes, but I feel like recently they were kind of known for like the, the stylish piece. Oh, yeah. Like I feel like I see oh, articles yeah. all the time of like oh, yeah. Taylor Swift wore this shoe from New Balance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll say I'm, I'm looking to elevate a fit and I'm looking for a stylish New Balance shoe. What would yeah. you go for? I mean, the 550s, 100%. Okay. Uh, the 550s are the coolest shoe like out. Everyone wants them now. Or the 650s, which are like the high top version. But if you're looking to elevate your style, definitely go with the 550s. Okay. I mean, <laughs> so got to rock. The next podcast I do with you, we'll be rocking the 550s. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On the Toyota piece, uh, this is actually a very legitimate question. So I'm actually going to buy a car next month. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's throw price out the window. <laughs> unlimited budget. Okay. Not the case, but yeah. let's just say unlimited budget. What Toyota car? What's the what's the car of choice so, for a, a new guy? A Forerunner. Okay, it's a perfect SUV. It's like so cool. And if you live in Austin, like Forerunner City, like it's the coolest car here. <laughs> so if I were you, I would go with that. I would do like all black, deck it out. Okay, like <laughs> Forerunner all the way. Forerunner yeah. with the five fifties on the <laughs> yeah, gas. Yeah, you're gonna be the coolest guy in Austin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> with the New Balance. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, speaking on New Balance specifically. Uh, I was actually talking to Pierce about this last week. Uh, we were listening to somehow Jack Harlow got put on in the car. <laughs> and I, we were talking about this podcast. And I was like, Jack Harlow is sponsored by New Balance. And Pierce was like, yeah, I think he goes to some of their indoor track meets. Yeah. Have you met Jack? And also, yeah. what's it like to be a part of a company who like sponsors random people like that yeah. who are so mainstream? I mean, it's so cool, right? Yeah, so I met him at the opening of the New Balance indoor track. Okay. Uh, like last year or two years ago. Um, that was really cool. It was really awesome to have him there. We had pretty much all of the New Balance brand ambassadors there across, you know, whether it's musicians or um, actors or athletes. I mean, everyone was there to celebrate that huge moment for New Balance, which is having that amazing new facility in Boston built and finished. Um, so that was really special. And, and to your point of how cool is it that New Balance has that and has that reach and I mean, it's, it's really special because, like I said, it's it's pretty intimate. It's not like they're just picking anyone and everyone they can get their hands on. It's very intentional, and these are real partnerships, and these are people who really value what New Balance stands for, and New Balance value, values what we stand for. So, yeah, it's awesome. I'm going to hit you with a, a Jack lyric uh, that I feel <laughs> like could— I quote this thing on Instagram way too much, and I don't know if people know it's from a Jack Harlow song. <laughs> I hope they think I came up with it. I did not. Uh, but it's in his song, Churchill Downs with Drake. Uh, and one of his first lines in the song is he says, I mean, the world's in denial, but they all know what I'm headed for. I love that. What are your thoughts on that? That I could love be that. that could be the mood for 2024. See, <laughs> the world's <laughs> in denial, is... but they all know what, what she's headed for. See, that is such a mood. I mean, I, I feel that. And I feel like what I love about track and I love about athletics is like we are just living proof of that constantly, like pushing the bounds. People will always put limits on you. They will always do that. And it's about exceeding those limits. And you might even put limits on yourself, but it's about exceeding those limits for yourself as well. And that lyric, that's it. Yeah. See, Jack yeah. knows what it's about. Jack yeah, knows, knows what it's about. <laughs> uh, on kind of the line of like confidence, confidence in yourself, um, even to like, you know, the world kind of knowing but still doubting. Mm. Um, I think last year during this time, I had a conversation with a super successful NCAA athlete, and he said what would go on to be, I think, the most quoted piece of any podcast I've ever done. Mm. He said, um, Sometimes you have to be so confident in yourself that other people think you're delusional. 
Mm. When I first heard that, I thought, mm. whoa, 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 whoa. Like, that's mm. kind of far. But then when I was, like, discerning, I was like, well, it actually, it makes a lot of sense to me. Because if you state your goals and if you actually chase after them, the world actually is kind of right to think you're delusional because you haven't done anything yep. that would indicate you're going to actually hit that thing. Yep. Um I think yep. Mr. Beast, we're throwing out all sorts of weird names. He's like, people will call you an idiot until you make it, and then they call you a genius. Yep. Um, exactly so what are your right. thoughts on confidence, even to the point of other people thinking you're delusional? I mean, to be a pro athlete, to do anything at this level, you do have to be a little crazy, and you do have to be a little delusional. I, I can't tell you how many times people have told me I can't do something. <laughs> it's like... It wouldn't be a normal day for me if someone told me I couldn't do something. And I think every athlete could probably relate to that. Like every athlete, every person that you talk to, every person in the the comments on your Instagram or your YouTube will tell you that you're just you're not going to do something. You're not going to run a fast hundred, or you're not a two hundred meter runner, or you can't run the four, or like you can't lift that, or you you can't make this time. You can't <laughs> go to Harvard and then be a pro athlete. You can't do anything. Like everyone will tell you that because they don't think they can do it they can't do it <laughs> like and so that's just that's just a part of our every day at this point um so I love that quote because you do have to be what they would say a little crazy a little delusional um until you do it uh, and, and that's the beauty of it I mean you don't know what you can't do and, until you've tried and I think what pro athletes do really well is constantly push that limit of what they can do and what they can't do and you're constantly living on the edge of, of that, of what you can and can't do. Um, whether that's like figuratively, mentally, emotionally, or physically. Um, yeah. Going back to something that, uh, this is just the podcaster's brain. I was like, got to ask her about this. And then I forgot. And I went into your college neurobiology and I was like, it'd be weird to pivot back. So I'm <laughs> pivoting back now. Um, back. one of my favorite things you've shared in this conversation is the aspect of environment. You've kind of nailed mm -hmm. that a bunch of times. And loyal listeners will hear me quote all the time the quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most mm. time with. And then I actually, in mm. that seat, interviewed a guy by the name of Sawhill Bloom, super accomplished yeah, person. I and he, he, um, he, I think I shared that quote with him because I talk about it all the time. And he actually said, it's, it's worse than that. He said, you, re, studies have shown recently that you resort to the lowest common denominator. Mm. So you could have four friends that are amazing, but if a fifth one is like mm -hmm. nagging you down, you're going to resort to that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious in relation to all of that, like how do you personally and have you in the past cut out people from your life? Because I think everyone is like, mm -hmm. yes, environment's important, but like the person that's nagging me down is a sibling or a cl close friend I've been friends with for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like how do you actually tangibly that's, work towards mm -hmm. a better friend group, better support system? That's a really good question, and that's so real. And I think like that brings me back to your question about the trade-offs, um, about what kind of trade-offs you have to make to be successful or where you are. And that is one of the hardest ones. It's, like I said, choosing which friends you can give your energy and time to, which people. Yeah, like you said, it could even be family. Um, and it doesn't have to be. It can start as a conversation. And a lot of times that's what I do is I'll have the conversation about what I need from the relationship, um, you know, what I can give to the relationship. And then if that doesn't work and it doesn't fit into your life and your goals, I, it just kind of naturally, it naturally ends up where it needs to be. And that can be one of the hardest parts of it. That is one of the hardest trade-offs is navigating those relationships and maybe even just losing those relationships or those relationships fundamentally changing. Um, it, it is it's so hard and it for me it has become a skill but it's a, it's a very sensitive skill to fine tune um <laughs> and and to learn to emotionally be okay with but yeah I mean sometimes people just don't fit into that that goal of what you want and that and that's really okay it's like it's nothing against their life or what their goals are everyone's goals just aren't the same at a certain given time um, and some relationships just have to fundamentally change. Um, it can happen naturally where you just kind of slowly fade away from those people. And that can be just as hurtful and just as hard, or it's like an abrupt conversation where both, both people understand or, or not. Um, but that is definitely one of the harder trade-offs of, of finding success, especially in sports. Let's talk about 2021. You win the U S Olympic trials in the 200 and you go on to place, was it third at the Olympics? Um, Yes. In the 200? Yeah, okay, yeah, third. Um, what were those experiences like? And 
yeah, looking at the timeline, you got Rico the year before. Yeah. Does that match up? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Coincidence? <laughs> oh, yeah. Coincidence? I think not. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, making the Olympic team was surreal for me. Um, like I said, I, I knew what I had done. You know, I knew I had prepared. I had done everything in my head. I feel like that was right. I moved to Austin, picked up and joined this group of girls who had already made the Olympic team. My coach had already been an Olympian. So I, in my head, you know, set myself up for success just by being in the proper environment. Um, and I had trained really hard and I thought, you know, this is it. So this is my opportunity to make the Olympic team or not. If I don't make the team, then I'm just going to do something else, right? Like I don't, I'll do another job. I'll just not do track. And so that was my moment. And I mean, beyond my wildest dreams, I not only made the Olympic team, but I, I won the championship and also had the fastest time since Flojo at that time. And again, I was in shock. I, I didn't expect that for myself, but like I said, I had done everything. I was confident in myself that I had done everything that I needed to do uh, by the time I got on that line. And so I think that's what really got me to that point that place that's why it was such a successful run for me because I had the confidence and I knew what I had done going into it um and then from there I became a favorite to win gold at the Tokyo Olympics and I mean after that championship I lost every race that I ran <laughs> and I, but it was still good enough to get a bronze medal at the Olympics um and even getting a medal was amazing for me I mean that that was something that was a huge accomplishment and it was a testament to how hard I had worked and how much I had done up into that point um, that being said, like when I was at the line for Tokyo, I was less confident because I was less confident that I had done everything that I needed to do up in that point to do well. After the championships, I mean, there was so much media, there was so much distractions going on. Uh, mentally, I wasn't as focused on track as I was, you know, just all the, the followers and all the extra things going on. Um, there was COVID happening, so we couldn't get to Tokyo with enough time to kind of like adjust to the jet lag and the, the time zones. And so I was a little less confident and I think that showed in my running, but overall, I mean, it was an amazing year for me. Um, I surpassed all of my limitations that I had set for myself. So it, yeah, that was incredible. And then ever since then, I've just been kind of thinking back to that year and, and trying to set myself up for if not the same success, but even better for Paris. After over 300 conversations with such successful athletes across so many different avenues, in my opinion, if I was to nail down the biggest struggle athletes have, it's the balance between being grateful for how far you've come mixed with mm -hmm. still wanting so much more. And yeah. I think a lot of people, it's such a fine line and so many people are constantly wanting things that it's not sustainable and they burn themselves out mm -hmm. or even after accomplishing amazing things, they're not happy enough. Yeah. But also, the contrary, a lot of people will just look at how far they've come and they get complacent. For you personally, how have you tried to find the correct balance there, specifically yeah. in a situation like the Olympics in 2021, where like, you know, you were the US champ, you're going in, yeah. you get third, but also I'm sure in the back of your mind, you're like, you're wanting more. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was really happy to, to get bronze and get third. I was happy to be an Olympian, I was happy to be a medalist. Um, those were just, it, it was another thing that really validated that I was on the right journey for myself. Um, I can definitely see how people would find success and get complacent, but I think the best athletes or the people who are the best in their industries are people who are just constantly pushing themselves. And like we keep saying, it's, it's not about the medals or the accolades. It's not about that. It's going to be about being the best version of yourself that you can be. And if that's constantly what you're thriving, you're striving for, that's what you're that's what you're working towards and you're going to continue to do well and you're going to have a sustainable career and you're going to have a successful career if that's what you're worried about. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm always going to be thriving for more, <laughs> whether it's a gold medal or whether it's me just changing career paths and doing something outside of track and field. I mean, I'm constantly pivoting. Um, I'm always going to be striving to be my best and, and do my best and get the best out of myself and whatever I'm doing. And, and that's kind of my mentality about it. Talking about 2023, this past year, it feels weird to say mm -hmm. last year. Um, I know. I know, it's so new, into the I new know. year. Um, so that specific race, before we get into it, uh, I was actually in the stadium. It was my first U.S. Champs. It was amazing, so oh, fun sweet. to see and be a part of. But uh, So I actually remember this very, very well. So much tension on the line. 
Uh, and there was like, it wasn't a false start, but someone got a green card for like yeah. something. And I remember rewatching it today. Like you can see you were so ready to get after it. Yeah. How do you maintain your composure where that actually could be the difference between, you know, <laughs> first and last uh, because you were so, you looked so ready. Yeah. And like you couldn't even see yourself get off the blocks, <laughs> and then you had to like resituate yourself. Oh my god! What's the process starts, in your mind? That kind of stuff is the worst because, yeah, so much goes into that, and like balancing your energy, especially for a quick sprint race. <laughs> like everything has to be so perfect, and you have to be so focused. And when that happens, you're just like, oh my god, here we go again. <laughs> and it wasn't even a false start. I think I think everyone was just like shaking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they people were like twitching. Yeah, people were just twitching, but like. I mean, especially in the blocks, because you never know how long they're going to hold you and like you might not be used to it. And then you're just like, it's a hard it's a hard position to hold. People don't realize that like <laughs> it takes a lot of strength. But yeah, I mean, so much goes into that. So for me, I do a lot of just meditation work. That's just what I do in my my day to day. I do like five minutes in the morning. I incorporate it into my warm up. I think it's really beneficial for athletes, especially. But honestly, anyone, it just keeps you like really focused. Um, it trains your brain to to maintain that um and so that's kind of what I do but in those moments I really like I balance my energy so precisely like I don't even listen to music when I warm up because I don't even want to be like amped up during that time because mm. I'm trying to save it for like that one moment yeah. on the line and so I'm just like very natural like very relaxed balancing that energy all the way up until that point like the whole day and then when I get to the line, that's when I'm like amping myself up. I'm like getting ready. I'm like, all right, let's go. And then I just channel all that energy into that moment. And so, yeah, when you have a false start, it's like, all right, here we go. Again. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah, redo yeah. this whole thing. But yeah, that's what it is. It's like, okay, like intense focus, focusing on maybe one cue that you're going to do when the gun goes off. And then all that energy goes into the race. We talked about the competitive nature of track and field. And I said we'd talk about in relation to pro running. As much as you're willing to elaborate, how – like aggressive does it get in terms of like beef between people <laughs> you thinking like I really want to beat this person what's yeah. that kind of behind the scenes nature look like um I think you know everyone's different but sprinters definitely have like their own egos <laughs> it's part of it and track is such a cutthroat sport because only one person can win and it's really like man versus man. <laughs> like it, like you're just on the line literally against your competitors and people use that figuratively for like every aspect of life, but in track it's, it's literal. And so it can be pretty intense. Um, we definitely have friendships like my teammates, the girls that I train with, sometimes I'll race against them, but they're like my sisters and I love them. Um, but when I'm on the line, it's, it's just really competitive. And I, I'm just, that's all I'm thinking about is how I'm going to beat the next person. And sometimes those attitudes can like come off the track and that happens. It happens like it kind of everywhere, everywhere in life. And, and that happens and it's fine. But I mean, I try to like focus on my own career and my own lane and keep my competitive energy like on the track. But yeah, I mean, beefs happen. <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. You just got to got to roll with it. <laughs> I have to ask again, as much as you're willing to elaborate, you don't have yeah. to if you don't want to. Uh, how has Shakari shifted the game in terms of like the events she's in are never the same when she's in them. In terms of just the energy <laughs> right. that's brought to the table, um, how do you handle that mixed with even like the spotlight? People are still focusing on you, but like legitimately as a fan, you're like, what move is she going to like? Is she yeah. going to tear off her wig? Like, right, right. I mean, all sorts well, of crazy stuff. I mean, I think that's really, I think it's fun. Like, I like following that kind of media stuff, and I think other people do too. So I think it's like, it's fun for the track world to have someone like that who can bring eyeballs to like every race. And honestly, like racing Shikari and being a rival of Shikari, I mean, it's brought like eyeballs to my career too. So I think that's really fun to be a part of. And I mean, I, I have to commend her ability to have all of that and still compete. Cause for a while it was like, okay, there's a lot of like media attention going on around you. Like that must be really hard. And it showed like, because you, you have to, be able to balance all of that and not let it get to you and affect you on the track. And I think she's like kind of come back to that. And she came back and won like world championships despite all of that going on. So that shows like a lot of maturity. And I mean, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot of energy when she's around. I mean, it's a lot of and that's kind of how I think that's how she fuels herself. She like 
fuels herself now off of that type of energy and that type of attention. And she needs to have like that competitive vibe with her rivals. Like if she needs to feel like she has some type of beef or like negative energy towards me to feel like she can beat me or win or that motivates her to win, then that's that's cool. And a lot of people do need that. You need like a, a reason. You need like something that's like, all right, I'm going to get that person. You need a lot of something to be Gabby right? Thomas. You need, <laughs> you need that edge. Exactly. So <laughs> like that's it. Um, I don't think I operate that way. Um, I don't think I could operate that way. Yeah. I don't think that it would just it would drive me insane or like it would make me a little too nervous because the way I operate is very like focused meditation myself. And that's just that works for me. And that gives me my edge. Um, and and maybe that's part of the tactic. Maybe part of it's like, all right, let's see if we can distract Gabby. Let's see. Let's see how many athletes we can distract with like the nonsense. And so the better like the best I can do is like <laughs> it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> shield out. Yeah. Shield yeah. out that nonsense. I mean, one thing. Yeah. Good luck beating me in a 200. But I mean, it works. It, it works for some people. And so, I mean, I think it's cool. And yeah, I mean, there's beef. But. You are right about the eyeball thing because I looked <laughs> up that race this morning and on NBC Sports, I think is the channel I was on. The YouTube video has like 4.3 million views. Like for track, yeah, that's bonkers, right? Like a lot of these playoff football games won't get that right? amount of views on the highlight. Um, right? All the more cool that you beat her and you won, and even though like she's I the title, that. you right. still won. And now um, I get the view. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. But we need that. I'm curious. What are the call rooms like uh, specifically oh. <laughs> in these situations? Because the call room is this kind of. This is why I'm like excited for like things like Netflix, which we'll get into. But yeah. like. That rarely are there cameras in there. No one really knows what's said or what the vibe is like. Yeah. Every race is different. Sometimes they hold you for f literally forever. Other times you just like check in and you're on the track. Uh, yeah. What is the tension like yeah. for like a U.S. championships, a world championships where everyone is in this small cubicle? It's crazy, right? It's crazy to think like, is there any, any other sport where you have to sit in like a small space with your competitors and just sit there for like 40 minutes facing each other? And like these, are, it's like smaller than this room, like the yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you're at with these people, and it's crazy. But I, it depends on the people. Um, so I mean, and and the race. So the the higher intensity race, like if we're in a world championship or Olympic call room or like trials, yeah, it's it's intense. Like everyone is quiet, almost everyone, and it just kind of is what it, you have like, this respect for one another, where you're like, all right, we know what we're about to go do, so. We don't need to talk. If I'm in there with like my teammate, we might talk a little bit, you know, hype each other up a bit, and that's kind of it. Um, and some personalities, some people are a little more talkative. Um, some people are, yeah, I mean, talkative. Probably maybe tactics to like distract other athletes. That might be a thing. Or some people might just be nervous chatter. Like that's also a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just depends on the personality and like the intensity of of the race. Yeah. I was <laughs> yeah. going to ask you about the getting in the headpiece. Uh, I heard on a different podcast, Cam, Cam Haynes's podcast, he interviewed Matthew Centro, their close friends. And yeah. Centro, I mean, I love the guy, like what he's done and running is awesome. You know, he yeah. won in 2016, which for a distance run in the US, insane. Yeah. But he said in call rooms, he would like to younger guys, I think this is so brutal to younger guys. He would say like, he would either go like, what's your PR in the eight or the four? And they would be like 149. And he would say, get ready to close in that today for like a 15 <laughs> and walk away. Does anything like that happen in terms of sprinting where like people are oh trying to get gosh. in each other's heads? See, I think what's funny, I think the male sprinters have more of that type of like messing with, you, with each other, like mentality, um, which I think is such a fun thing that I wish we could bring into women's sprinting more, which is why I say like, you know, all the Shakari stuff. I mean, it's it's not my style, but I, I think it's fun and I think it brings something to the sport. Um, cause I feel like they're doing that all the time. Like they're messing with each other. Like they go on like media days and these interviews and they're, they're like messing with each other and poking fun. But as women in the sport, if we do that, I mean, you're like villainized immediately and people are like, Oh my God. But no, that kind of messing with, with each other is not happening in the call room. Okay. I mean, that's not, no one's <laughs> asking you questions like that. They're just not. And I, I wonder if that would get in anyone's head. I can't imagine any of the female sprinters that I race against right now, like who are in the final world of the Olympics, letting that kind of talk get to them. Mm. I just can't imagine. Maybe in like a semifinal or a prelim round, but I'm not about to mess with right. <laughs> some some new athlete who I know I'm sure. going to beat. Like I'm not sure. about to do that. <laughs> Whether it's Shakari or someone else, uh, are are they like brain? Are they like? 
ingrained on your brain during practice, during the hard track workouts? Like, do you ever use people like that as motivation to be like, she's working really hard. I know I got to nail this last 300 rep or even in those boring moments that we were talking about, like using that as motivation to be like. Yeah, I mean, me personally, I'm not thinking about other people. I'm always kind of thinking about myself and okay, I do envision, okay, this is like the world championship final. This is a mentality I need to bring to that final. I'm going to bring it here on the track today. I do think of that. Um, Am I thinking about my competitors? Never. Because again, that's just not something I can control. I don't know what they're doing. I can pretend I do, but I don't. Sure. Um, And maybe that's just like, some type of cockiness in me to not worry about what they're doing, but I, I just don't. And I think that's a healthier way to go about it. Yeah. Do you think that's been crucial to in performing in these clutch moments where yeah. like, you know, the semis and like getting to a final is hard and so <laughs> yeah. much can go wrong yeah. and you never know who is going to be lined up on the other right. lanes. Do you think the ability to focus on yourself and just yourself year round helps with that where it's like, I'm yes. just running my race yes. and therefore like, I don't really care what yes. the rest of the top people are doing. Yes, but I think everyone is different. I do think some people need to be worried about their competitors. Some people need to run other people's race. Like you need to be thinking about what they're going to do and, <laughs> and think about beating them. Um, I think, I've gotten to a point where I can just focus on my own race and just (laughs) run, like do what I need to do and execute what I need to do. But when I was first starting out, like when I was running, you know, before I made the Tokyo Olympic team, it was, it was a matter of beating the person in front of me. That's all I was thinking about. I didn't know my race strategy that well. I didn't know what I was capable of, but I just knew I needed to be winning the race. So that was my focus. But now it's like over time shifted to, the 200 is my race. Like, that's mm-hmm. my jam. Um, you're going to have to do something really special to beat me in it. You're going to have to, you know, do like Sharika Jackson and go for a world record type thing. And so if I run my race and I know that I'm doing it well. So, yeah, I'm not thinking about that. But that's also why I have my training partners. Like, I have the environment that I have set up the way it's set up because that's all I need to do. They're, like, these girls have better starts than me. There are girls who can do longer workouts better than me. Like, I have it on every end of the spectrum. So I'm constantly trying to beat them in training. Um, and I mean, they just, they're better than me at a lot of things. <laughs> and so I'm around that constantly. So if I'm at a meet, I'm not going to be spooked or like, oh my God, what do I need to do? Cause I've already practiced with the girls. Talking about this Netflix documentary, what do you think is the effect it'll have on the sport? Were you included at all? Mm-hmm. What was the behind I the think, scenes? I think the Netflix documentary is going to be really good for the sport. I think it's, uh, who doesn't want to know what goes on behind the scenes in track and field? I mean, we just need, like, people to know what's going on. Yeah, they that's why I'm asking these they, questions. Right? They yeah. need to know, like, what meets to watch, how to watch them, like, who's racing. That's all they need to know. And people would love to watch track. It's the most watched sport in the Olympics because people, they know what's going on. Right. So I think the Netflix documentary is going to be huge. Um, yeah, they did feature me in it. So they followed Let's my go. They followed my season. Um, and there were a lot of ups and downs. And they, I mean, there's a lot that people wouldn't expect to see. And so I think that's really helpful. Um, and I'm excited to see what they do with it. And yeah, they've captured a lot of the on the track stuff and the performance and the warm ups and going to meets. And they also saw a lot of the off the track stuff. And they they saw a lot of the arguments and the fights that go on like <laughs> like between meets and whatever. So I think I think it'll be good. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for people to see like what what goes into it. Do they like come down to Austin and like film and stuff? Yeah, they really? came to Austin. That's yeah. so cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited for that. I'm yeah. so excited. So did that bring a level of added pressure to you do you feel like um and like mm-hmm. i don't know if there's a season two coming i was watching breakpoint the tennis documentary yeah. which i'm obsessed with and i'm Love not even it. like a tennis guy per se um yeah. and that's why i was like so interested about like the shikari stuff as well because i remember season one like rafael nadal was like sprinting back and forth in like their version of the call room yeah and, like you can see people getting rattled so yeah i well, think it's cool yeah. seeing like the crossover between sports and yeah anyways but in relation to this documentary like season two um the athletes season one had gone live yeah, whereas yeah. like season one no one really knows about it or what's right. being said or it's not released exactly. so what do you think is like that balance too between the differences what of like season one versus like a season two where like when season two is out season one's been out so like there's the pressure people know you're being filmed now oh true yeah yeah i mean that was a very long question it was i mean no the the pressure it it wasn't much it wasn't much added pressure i mean you already you're constantly being filmed i mean there's media going around everywhere and in the sport of track there's so much pressure innately that like an extra netflix camera it's not gonna (laughs) add anything more at least that's how i thought about it because it's such a high intensity sport and so much pressure going into it um but yeah i mean i think 
I think that would just make the sport even better and more intense. And what I love about track athletes specifically is that those of us who are at the top thrive under that type of pressure. And we, we just thrive under that and just knowing that more eyes are watching or that it's going to be on Netflix or more people are like paying attention to certain small aspects and we just thrive under it. And I, I love that about the sport and I love that about the people who are at the top in track and field too. It just adds so much to it. Going back to New Balance, I have to ask you this. Uh, are you involved at all in the kits you wear, uh, the oh, design yeah. of them? Do you yeah. have a choice between specific ones versus other ones? Yeah. And you're one of the only athletes that wears one of the sleeves, which yeah. I think very drippy. Uh, what is that? I, I think I read something that like it reminds you to like accelerate off the line. Oh yeah. Have you ever thought about double yeah. sleeving it? Uh, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, um, yeah. New Balance does let us uh, give insight on the kits, which I really like too. Um, I know when they signed me, so I was their first female sprinter that they had signed, and we had a lot of talks about just even how the kit like fits. Like sprinters are just we're built a little bit differently than like the distance girls. It just a lot of glute muscles going on here, a lot happening. And so we just had a lot of like conversations about how the, even the uniform kit can fit us better, which I really like. And then, yeah, we have design conversations too. And I think New Balance does an amazing job. Um, we always like stand out on the line. I love seeing like New Balance athletes running because the kit just looks amazing. Yeah. Everyone just always, they always looks good. Pop. Yeah, they pop. It just looks so good and so cool. Um, so, yeah, we've had those conversations. Uh, what was the last part of your question? Uh, the sleeve thing. Oh, yeah, the, the sleeve thing. Sleeve. Okay, yeah. I, so I have a cue when I come out of the blocks, and my coach gave it to me. Just you have to, like, punch the air. Like, just punch and go. Um, since it's such an intense start, you just need something to focus on um, to get you going and get your reaction time good because a reac reaction time can <laughs> make or break a podium finish. Um, so, yeah, I just keep it on because I'm, like, conscious of the feeling. And so I'm like, all right, something's there. Let's get it up. Do you and ever go. do it in practice, like a specific hard workout? You're like, I need that extra boost. Sleeves oh, coming out. I don't even wear the sleeves during practice. I've never thought to do that. No, I should. Okay. <laughs> I should. Like that's a, a good specific idea. hard workout. No, that's yeah. a good idea. See, it's every, things that give you that edge. Yeah, no, I'm going to try that. This is why we do podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Give Gabby Thomas that edge. Paris, coming up, <laughs> Olympic year. What's the, you know, energy shift from 2023 to uh, 2024? I mean, it's huge. Like we say, everyone's watching Olympic years. They're going to have the Netflix documentary coming out right before then. Um, everyone's watching. It's going to be even bigger than Tokyo, I imagine, just because it's not COVID. People are, you know, back to caring. People will be there. Um, so it's a huge energy shift. Um, and for me, I mean, coming off of the momentum of such a good year, 2023 was my best season. Um, I'm feeling really good about it. And I'm like a reach. I'm 27 now. So I'm, I'm reaching an age where I, you know, I should be going to my peak. I should be performance performing really well uh so i'm excited to see what i can do and it, I, women's track right now is just really hot it's a really good product i think there are a lot of eyes on it you have really exciting stars like shakari um the jamaican women are just on fire right now too and yeah i mean I, i'm really really pumped about it it's an exciting time to be a fan what does it feel yeah. like from an athlete perspective like you mentioned the jamaican shakari yeah like it's kind of a given that all of you guys are going to bring your A game this yeah, year in given. every race. Yeah. What's it like to feel that energy and be a part of that energy, be leading that? I'm um, Being a part of it, a lot of mixed feelings. Um, one is like I know what it's going to require of me. So that means today, like right now in January, working really hard because what we do right now is actually going to determine the medal. People are always going to be watching in August and seeing us compete. But really, it's what we're doing now that it's going to determine who's like on that medal stand. So... So just understanding that, um, getting mentally and emotionally ready for it too. Uh, we talk a lot about like being physically prepared and training and all that, but it's just a really emotional period and it takes a lot of like mental resilience, mental strength, mental balance to even get to that point as well. So preparing yourself for that. And for me, just really like enjoying this ride and enjoying this journey. Like I'm, I'm so excited. It's going to be it's definitely going to be a historic Olympics um, and being a part of that and being a part of something so special, um, something so empowering. It's amazing. And I'm, I'm happy to be in the company of, of women like that. I mean, this is what I've always dreamed of. And I'm just happy to be like using my time and spending my energy on something so impactful. Um, so I'm, I'm ready for it and I'm really excited and I, I can't wait to see where this year takes me. We brought up uh, Sahil earlier, and he shared this thing. I'd actually agree with him that he thinks the hardest thing in life is knowing when to stop things. Mm. Um, I believe that was him who shared that concept. Mm. When you think about your track career as a whole, 
do you feel like there are things you need to accomplish before hanging up the spikes? Or how do you approach that conversation Mm -hmm. of one day leaving the sport? Because you are in the thick of it. You're in the peak years of your career. You're absolutely crushing it. So it's like, you don't have to consider this anytime soon. But do you ever think about that? What's crazy with track is I feel like we always see people and athletes who don't know when to stop, right? And you don't know when to hang up the spikes. And it's really hard because with track, it, it comes so abruptly, and I don't think anyone's ever, like, emotionally and mentally prepared for it. Like, it's not like other sports where you can kind of hang on and rely on your teammates or still hang on the team. It's like when your body st- starts to shut down, that's that's kind of it. Like, those, those fractions of a second are going to be the difference between you being able to compete with the best and not. So it's something that I have thought about. It's still a ways off for me, um, but I always tell myself, and I've told myself from the beginning, just – when I'm done with it, when I'm not enjoying it anymore, then that'll be it. And I think I've set up my life in a way where it can be it whenever I want. If I wanted to hang up the spikes today, that would be completely fine. Um, and so whenever I don't want to do it anymore, I won't. But it's hard to say I'll know because there's a lot that I still have left that I want to accomplish in the sport. And I'm sure, you know, a gold medal will be one of those one of those accomplishments. But in track, there's always more you can do. Like, you look at people like Sydney McLaughlin, for example. I mean, she has world record. She has a gold medal. But there's always going to be something more you can do. You can always make that world record even more unattainable. You can switch events. You know, you can be the most decorated female athlete in history if you want. Like, there's so much more you can do. It's like, okay, when do you stop? And for people like us in the sport, you're constantly striving for more. That's kind of like our innate personality types is we're always wanting to push it, like we talked about before. And so understanding when to stop can be really hard. Um, But for me, it'll be when I feel like I've gotten the most I can out of the sport, when I feel like I've gotten all that I can out of the sport. I think that'll be when I can stop. When you do stop and hang up the spikes, what do you, what do you want to be remembered by? Mm, That is such a good question. I'd want to be remembered like by my longevity in the sport, my sustainability and how well I competed, but also just, by redefining what it means to be a pro athlete to people, like redefining what your journey has to look like. I think that my journey to here has been so different from every other athlete. And I would hope that a younger generation will look at my career and look at what I've done in the sport and just really felt inspired and felt like it was a little bit different. I think like coming from Harvard to be a pro sprinter is just not something that is really done. People tell you you can't do it. So if people can look at my my journey and say, okay, I can do it my way, then I think that would be a, a success for me. Um, if they look at how I present myself and how I carry myself on the line as a sprinter, you know, I think that would be a success for me. Um, yeah, I think that's what I, how I'd want to be. Remembered. I love it. Yeah. Two final questions for you. One serious, one fun mm-hmm. one. A serious one. Something I've been reflecting on over the past six months of just like living in the digital age is the fact that, you know, as long as probably until the day we die, like stuff will be up. Like my kids and grandkids and great grandkids could listen to my podcasts or look at my social media posts and same for you. So something I've done with very specific guests, you being one of them in a minute is like putting something in a time capsule because like your kids, grandkids, um, Gabby, five years from now, could come back and listen to this specific episode. So I think it's a unique opportunity to kind of put something in a time capsule. So what do you want uh, whoever, future Gabby, Gabby's kids, what do you want them to know about Gabby Thomas on January 17th, 2024 (laughs) at 108 p.m.? I love that. Oh, that's so funny. Um, Gosh, Um, I would say that is such a weird thing to think about. I would want them to know that I am living my best life and I am loving the life that I have built for myself, just doing my best and pushing myself every day. And I am so proud of how far I've come and I'm excited of how far I have to go. Gabby, final question. I ask every single guest on every single episode, if you had Gordon Ramsay coming over to your house for dinner, what would you (laughs) choose to make for him? I want to see it on Netflix. What would I make for him? Oh, gosh. I would make, hmm. I'm scared, but <laughs> <laughs> I would make him, let's see, I've just started cooking this month, believe it or not, and so I've 
I've made these really, really good like chicken tacos mm. that I think I would make for him with some corn tortillas. And I think I think they would be pretty good. I I think that's very yeah. Austin esque too. Yeah, it's Gives very some Austin culture. esque. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get some culture in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Gabby, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. I, again, I had this conversation with you beforehand, but like I feel like no like top top sprinters specifically do these sorts of things. Yeah. I think we're like just over an hour forty. Uh, it's an absolute treat as a fan of you and more importantly a fan of track and field to get the opportunity to sit yeah. down, talk about merit, and also yeah. <laughs> go deep and put some stuff in the time capsule. So thank you yeah. so much. Looking forward to seeing you crush it. And uh, I guess in the words of Jack, <laughs> the world's in denial, but she, they all know what she's headed for. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. <laughs>